fair state, which is a statement that Scott made as the United States entered the war in the spring of uh, 1917. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go on a Nantucket sleigh ride through 30 months. I wanted to keep it pretty tight because a lot was happening to Scott internationally and also nationally. Uh, between his writings on the subject of war itself and the profiteering that was going on around it, especially through American uh, financiers and bankers and industrialists, and uh, going right through his own experiences in his teaching profession and what happened to him. So what I want to start with is really going back to 1915 when he was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania at the Wharton School. And he's uh, basically, some, he's given his pink slip after the school closes and becomes quite a cause celeb about around the issue of academic freedom, but is not able to regain his job. But the University of Toledo picks up his contract, you might say, and he is hired in 1915 to begin in the fall as the dean, basically, of the social um, the social science and economic department, and also as a professor. So he begins teaching there and quickly becomes um, entangled again with people who have money and who are supporting college, especially around the issue of, again, why he was kicked out of the University of Pennsylvania was his stance against child labor. And at that point, the industrialists depended on child labor. It's cheap, it's plentiful, it's uh, renewable, and when it goes bad, you just replace it. So Scott was very much against that. And in, when he went to Toledo, he continued these studies. But he also broadened them, because at this point, in 1915, 1916, there's a real um, intensification of the war. In August 1914, with the killing of Ferdinand in Serbia, all these intertwining treaties that had been developed over the past hundred years in Europe entangled everybody in the World War. And Wilson said that he was going to stay neutral. And neutrality basically meant that they wouldn't enter the war and the government, quote, wouldn't support either side, either of the belligerents. However, the American industrialists did support one side or the other. And they uh, supplied, as any profiteering organization and industrialist will do, you'll sell, sell to both sides if the prices are right. However, the majority of the money was being made and invested in the British side. And Scott was seeing this. And as this was moving forward, as the industrialists were extending more and more credit to the British, and um, the French to fight the war, the American financiers and bankers were becoming more and more entangled. And they wanted to have guarantees that they were going to get their money back. Even though they were making good profits, they still had a, a lot of outstanding loans. And so what they started to really develop was this idea of preparedness. That the United States needed to be prepared for the possibility Many felt the in, in, in inevitability of the United States going into the war. And Scott uh, was very much against this and was involved with various peace groups that were against it. In the fall of uh, 1916, Wilson is running for re-election. And he runs on basically the slogan, he kept us out of the war. And however, he's also preparing people with this idea of preparedness, that we need to be prepared for war even though I kept you out of it. And Scott is following this tour with other peace uh, speakers in basically a shadow tour speaking against it. And as he goes along, um, he gains a lot of notoriety, both good and bad. What really changes is in the spring of 1917, uh, the 2nd of April, Wilson asked for a declaration of war from Congress. And it's basically for two reasons. At that, um, on the, I believe it's the 1st of April, the, uh, the Germans uh, announced that they are going to uh, 
restart their program of unlimited U-boat torpedoing of any ship on the high seas. There is no neutrality for a German U-boat. The United States have been sending a lot of industrial materials over and raw materials to um, England and France, and the Germans felt that this was not a neutral act, and therefore that the American ships were fair game. It also came to light, it was known as the Zimmerman Telegram. And the Zimmerman Telegram purported to be a communication from Germany to Mexico uh, that there would be an alliance between them and that Mexico would attack the United States. And at this point, if you know a little bit of Mexican history, you've gone through in 1910, the Mexican Revolution. Um, it was very splintered into states. Pancho Villa had made a foray into across the U.S. border into Texas, had killed some people and come back. And that's where uh, General Jack Black Pershing was sent in by Wilson to track him down. So we had basically invaded Mexico at that point. We had troops in Mexico. So this Zimmerman telegram scared Wilson, or it was used as a excuse for asking for this declaration from the Congress. And at this point, Scott tenders his resignation to the board at the University of Toledo because he basically says, um, look, I've warned you against preparedness. I told you this war was coming. I told you that the financiers were behind it and they were going to push it through and that they control uh, all the powers of not only finance but also communication through the newspapers. And really, it's in the best interest of the university that I'm not here. Scott had supporters at the University of Toledo, and the vote came down 5-4 in his favor. However, five days later, they met again. Two of the supporters failed to show up for no apparent reason, and he lost the vote 4-3. to three. However, he didn't lose, they didn't accept his resignation. Sound familiar about the Communist Party? What they did was, it was a non-renewal of contract. So again, bureaucracy finds a way through its machinations to uh, have its way. So at this point, I'm telling you a little bit of what Scott's saying, but what is Scott writing? And uh, one of the things that he's uh, looking into, he says in Cincinnati, freedom and justice for all, as recited by innocent children, is humbug. That'll get you a long way with the VFW and the GAR. He also, um, at that point, the Anthony Wayne chapter of the Sons of the American Revolution denounced him. He is utterly repugnant to the intelligent, legal, and patriotic people of Toledo. So you start seeing one of the things that um, Wilson did was he developed, uh, he brought in a man named George Creel. And George Creel did, started developing a propaganda department that was going to be pro-war. And the slogan under which they um, moved forward on all this propaganda was 100% American. If you weren't for us, you were totally against us. Echo? It comes up all the time. So Scott is starting, to, he's still out on the speaking tours, and he's starting to get this friction, and that's why he offered his resignation. Uh, he also says in Toledo, under the present system, the man who has money gets more than just dr by just drawing interest, while the man who hadn't the advantage, m advantage must work hard so that the dividends may be paid to the other who doesn't work. Basically, that's what his argument was around the capitalist system, was that those who work, work for those who don't work through the payment of dividends. Now, I was kind of wondering, all right, who are some of the people that we're dealing with here? And I was just, uh, one of the financiers of this period was very famous and very well known was Bernard Baruch. And he was a financier and just one of his holdings, he had a large uh, holding of shares in the Itola Mining Company. Now, this mining company happened to produce tungsten for tungsten steel. In 1916, 
the war demand drove up the price by a thousand times. So in that one year, he made six hundred thousand dollars in dividends just on the holdings of his share. I don't think that any of the miners saw a commiserate pay raise of that magnitude. And this was what Scott was arguing against, that somebody who simply held shares was parasitic to the economic body of the worker. That they would, uh, that the, those who owned and didn't work were sucking the lifeblood, not only out of the planet, but the workers and everything around them. And if you, and I bring this up every year, if you see um, the book that was written by Piketty four or five years ago, he has a very simple, it's called Capital, has a very simple equation, and it's R is greater than G. And this is what Scott is talking about. R is the rate of growth. Um, no, it's R is the rate of return, and it is greater than growth. So basically, when people are living on dividends and not producing anything, it's a Ponzi scheme. You have to take from one place to give to another. And over time, it will collapse because it, has not, it doesn't have anything under it. Some of the other uh, stellar individuals that we're dealing with, these are some of the old book goodies. We read about them all the time. was John Pierport Morgan, who was an American financier. But his ton, uh, son, John Pierpont uh, Jr., took over. Um, around 1913, 1914, how fortunate the old man died at that point because now he's going to make real money for himself. Uh, he took over the family business, business and acted as an agent for the allied governments in the U.S. and built up a web of loans that drew U.S. industrial and financial firms into a pro-war stance. John D. Rockefeller, he's another one. Um, over the decades, he had mastered the art of a hostile takeover and corporate consolidation until he had amassed a, a petroleum monopoly known as the Standard Oil. This was broken up by antitrust laws, but his influence and income were a little affected. After he had retired in 1911, uh, he built four large charitable corporations, and this is something else that Scott invaded against. The charitable corporations um, were giving money that they had stolen from the people in the first place, mm -hmm. so that they weren't truly charitable. And, of course, John D. Rockefeller is famous for spending his dotage giving dimes to the poor. Very generous individual. There was uh, Mayor Guggenheim, who was a switch-born capitalist, and he came to the U.S. at 19, and he made himself a uh, copper magnet by controlling the industry through uh, American smelting and refining company. And then his son, Daniel, took over and brought in the business out into gold mines, rubber plantation, nitrate deposits. And there were also six more sons in the business. So what you're seeing is, over time, is not only that you have um, a hierarchical plutocracy, but it's also uh, hereditary, that the unearned income is passed on from one generation to another. So that's what Scott's saying. He's also saying workers are, in an economic, are an economic asset. They create prosperity. The owners live parasitically upon the proceeds of the work which the workers are doing. Not making him the most popular person to the trustees of these large universities who not only depend on um, the trustees for donations, but also depend on getting their appropriations from the legislature. And who controls the legislature? Same people who control the trustees. One of the things uh, that came up about this four to three vote was in those six days, the word came down that one of the people who was involved with the trustees said, you get rid of Nearing or you have no appropriation this year, period. We cut you off. Yeah, so two of the allies, we assume, I would assume, don't show up. So you get the four to three and it's a done deal. That's how power works. So uh, what happens after this is uh, a real acceleration because this is April and he's at, Wilson is asked for the declaration of war. Of course, he gets it, I believe, within two weeks. So now you're having a ramping up. You're going from preparedness to actual a military stance and we're moving towards conscription now. The conscription, the draft is being put into place. And Scott is uh, going around again 
speaking against that. I'm opposed to tyranny, despotism, and irresponsible power, whether vested in a king, Kaiser, or any other individual or group of individuals. The only possible way to save the present day world from militarism is to cut it off at the root and establish an industrial democracy. I revere the government that represents democracy. I honor the flag that stands for liberty and justice. So strong is my feeling that I resent seeing the government turned over to the irresponsible plutocracy, some of the gentlemen I was just reading to you about, just as I resent having the flag used to cloak special privilege and shameless exploitation. It's sadly familiar to us. And some people would consider, oh, that's just, this is just agitprop. No, this is the problem. This is an agitprop. The special privileges and the shameful exploitation are the problem. And they've intensified in various ways over time. Uh, one of the really interesting um, points that Scott makes in Great Madness, which is the book, the pamphlet he gets in trouble with, with the federal government later, is he looks into the liberty bond. So at the begin during preparedness and uh, Wilson coming in and asking for the declaration of war, there was uh, an understanding, a gentleman's understanding, uh, with the industrialists and the financiers and the bankers that basically they would cough up money to fund the war. Well, the war comes along and the profits are good and why would we do that? So they come up with the idea of the Liberty Bond. Now the idea of the Liberty Bond is that you get people, the workers, to pay for your war for you. With the promise that at the end of the war you get your money back with a little interest. In the meantime, you also have Congress pass taxes on beverages, tobacco, transportation. Everything that the working man consumes, he tax. So basically when the working man gets paid back for his liberty bond, it's his tax money coming back to him over time. So basically the rich didn't pay anything. They cashed in on what they were making and they didn't have any financial responsibility to pay up for say the liberty bonds. And it became very, uh, it was a very problematic thing because people lost their jobs if they didn't buy the liberty bonds. It became uh, incredible peer pressure. You lose your job, you can lose your housing. Um, it was, if you want to look into that period, there's a couple of really great books on just how toxically aggressive that period was against any type of questioning or radicalization. Not even moderate liberalism was quashed at this point. It's a really sad um, point. Support the boys over there, over there. Uh, you could. It depended, and they had drives, so people who did more got more accolades for, for, for you know, putting up more money. So it became a whole thing. And if uh, you see some of the uh, films around that time, especially uh, suffragette movies, you'll see a lot of that drive because a lot of that warmongerism really took the drive for the woman's vote out for a while, from 16 to 18. They finally regrouped themselves and were able to force Wilson into giving the vote. But for those two or three years, it was really tough. Uh, and war does that. So at this point, the end of April, when Scott was in uh, Pennsylvania in Philadelphia teaching, he was part of a mayoral cam of uh, campaign. I think it was 1912, 1913. Might be 14. Anyway, there was a reform candidate for the mayor of Philadelphia. And he was on the team promoting it. And he was in a church at that point. I believe it was Baptist. And the minister was very pro-reform. And he said so. From, he backed up the candidate. That night he got a call from the Penrose machine which controlled Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. And then the next Sunday, he said that there was absolutely nothing wrong with Pennsylvania politics. It was the best on the face of the earth. And he rescinded his support of the reform candidate. Scott never belonged to a church after that event. 
that was a cutting off point. So when he's in Toledo and this whole thing goes down with him be leaving the University of uh, Toledo and speaking out against preparedness and speaking out against the war and beginning to speak out against um, the financiers and all this. Some of the most vocal critics are ministers of the gospel. And one thing that Scott said uh, in the summer of 1916 at the Chautauqua, he taught there for many years, when I find a church in Toledo that preaches Christianity, I will attend that church. There was a minister from Toledo uh, who took Scott the ta task, and the way he did it, he says, there are 140 churches in Toledo, and there are at least a dozen that preach Christianity. Mm -hmm. And Scott said, fine, you find me one and I'll go. Well, it's never taken up on the challenge, because at this point, 1916, they're really moving towards preparedness, and the Prince of Christ, the Prince of Peace, Christ, is not going to be listened to when war mongering starts. Um, and what was interesting is that just how Reverend Stockdale from Toledo had welcomed Scott to speak from his pulpit many times, and they were friends. And then on April 29th of this year, 1917, he said, Scott Nearing should shut up and stay shut up. When the country is thrust into war, it is no time to preach disloyalty or to talk dissension. Men who do are guilty of treason. They are traitors. This is from the pulpit. This is part of the sermon. In February of 1918, uh, a Father Gillis said, Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. Pontius Pilate was the Prince of Pacifists. He washed his hands, as they do, of the right and wrong of the whole matter. He, was washed, he had washed his hands in water, and he was drenching his soul in blood. So Scott is, this is what Scott's dealing with from the clergy. <laughs> Forget the power structure. This is what he's getting from the, church, the, the clergy. And what Scott said, if I were to follow Stockdale and uh, Gillis's advice and hold my peace, I should stand before the world as a coward and before my conscience as a moral prostitute. Nay, more, it is my social duty to use the knowledge that I have acquired at public expense to defend the institution of democracy. Democracy rests on free discussion. And I think that's really interesting. It's not free speech. It's free discussion. It's not just about him speaking. It's the discussion part that he's really interested in. I find that word choice very um, illuminating. And another Catholic priest, Father O'Brien from Toledo, hears this and says, God forgive me, men. Guess who he's in front of? People are about to go off to the war. God forgive me, men, if it's unchristian, but I feel tonight like taking him by the nape of the neck and hanging him to the nearest tree. Uh, I think we're getting kind of far afield from the gospel, although we are getting closer to the Old Testament. So this is some of the social pressure that Scott's getting. Um, He's still being outspoken. At this point, the People's Council um, of Peace and Democracy is developing, and Scott is part of, that's how he starts having a little bit of money again. He's hired by them for what the papers called the propaganda wing of the organization, which means he's a speaker and an effective speaker. And it's, uh, they have their first big count, uh, conference in New York City in May. That summer, Scott goes off and sh lectures at Chautauqua again, that's the last summer he's invited there. Because guess what? Chautauqua was based on religious institution. That's what it was based off of. And so when all the other clergy were starting to snipe at him and point out his non-Christian behavior for not being for the war, then Chautauqua quietly, you're not coming back next summer. Nice knowing you. Goodbye. 
And of course, he has a point in making of a radical where he has many discussions with the people from the board of the uh, University of Toledo and some of the people at Chautauqua. Uh, Scott, you have to understand, this is not personal. But we're going to have to give you a headshot anyway. And that's what war fever does. So in November of 1917, Scott's again, he's, it, what's really amazing about Scott is when he's under this type of pressure, what he usually does is run towards the fire and talk louder. And so he's making a tour around the United States. He's speaking on uh, the great madness, his pamphlet. He also has another pamphlet that came out a year or two earlier called um, The Germs of War which in 1923 will become oil in the germs of war. So he's developing an idea around natural resources and war and finance and industry capitalism. And he is arrested in Duluth, Minnesota uh, by um, Captain McCarrison. What's interesting about this is it's a small gathering. They have 40 cops. They take in 40 cops into a pacifist meeting because you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, they arrest Scott and they arrest four other people, uh, four other people for disorderly conduct. Uh, it turns out that they were in the building, which is disorderly. Uh, what's interesting also about Scott at this point is that within, he's in jail overnight. He goes before um, a municipal judge, pleads guilty. $100 bail, bond, and gets out of Dodge. This is another thing that he learns over time. Don't stay in the jail. Get out as fast as you can. Because the jails are, <laughs> well, we know what jails do in our day and age, and they were even less um, under supervision in Scott's day and age, especially with war fever going on. Nobody's going to care if a pacifist gets beat up in jail. He, 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 he slept. He hit his entire body on something jagged. So this is what he's dealing with over time. He's also, at this point, in, uh, later in March of 1918, um, there's an article in the newspaper where he's going to go and speak at Edmund Evans' house in Admore, outside of Philadelphia. It is a private meeting, and the... Captain Donahue of the police department is hearing from the upright citizens of the town. I have been told in no uncertain terms by men of the mainline communities, i.e. the people of power, that if Nearing is permitted to carry out his plan and speak, they will tar and feather him. And the men who have sent this word to me are no riffraff. What's interesting to me is, as we go through this, um, let me do one more, and then I'm going to tell you what's interesting to me about this. In January of 1918, Scott's speaking in New York City, and he bumps into, just happens to bump into a federal marshal. He just happens to be hanging out at Scott's pacifist meeting. Uh, his name is, what is his name? Um, Thomas MacArthur, you are just the kind of bird I want to get. If I ever do get you, I will send you so far that you will be a long time in getting back. There may be hemp picnics in Central Park on Sunday mornings for just such as you. And those sworn to uphold the law, I will stand on the fringe of the crowd and clap. It's a federal official basically saying, I hope they lynch you. All right, we're going to take a sidebar now. Because this has gotten sadly of interest. And the sidebar is um, Father O'Brien threatened Scott with hanging. Uh, Mr. Um, the Federal Marshal just threatened Scott with uh, hanging. And what I really want to look into here is lynching. Because in 1928, Scott writes a book on black America. And it has a whole section of photographs in it. And several of the photographs are of lynching and burnings of blacks in the South. 
And I think one of the reasons why Scott added this was not only that he was outraged by it, but he had also been threatened in his personal safety by the very same thing. And if you're looking at the war, one of the things that Wilson feared, he did, you know, you, years later, you can look into his personal papers. And in 1516, he's contemplating going into the war. And what he's really concerned about going into the war is that it will coarsen and harden uh, the American populace into more belligerence. Well, one of those outcomes of a propaganda machine, which is pushing 100% Americanism, everybody has to go along, and you have to give up your money through buying liberty bonds, is that people who are out of step are open to any type of bodily destruction because they're not with us. And you also have to take into consideration at this time that the movie industry is really starting to get going. And it's going from Nickelodeon over from two reels to actually feature length films. And one of the first most important films, unfortunately, of that period is W.D. Griffith's 1915 Birth of a Nation, which basically revitalizes the Ku Klux Klan in the South. And you think, oh, okay, that's a southern problem. Well, guess what? Remember Scott was arrested in Duluth, Minnesota? 1920, there was a lynching of three black men for the time-honored white charge of raping a white woman. They were arrested. They were put in the jail. Mob showed up. They were pulled out. Thousands of people watched them hang and burn in the center of Duluth, Minnesota. I've read a book on the Ku Klux Klan in Vermont. 1927, they, they had a big convocade up near Mount Pelier. And I've seen the shots. There's a couple of hundred people there. Ku Klux Klan was not just a southern problem. And so really look at the toxic stew that you're in at this point uh, from all levels, from a worker's uh, rights level, gone out the window. Uh, control of the plutocracy, as Scott called it, coming into more and more power, and any type of dissent quelled in any means that was at their um, command. And I don't know if any of you have read this, um, Tahanesi Coates' The World. <whistles> He's got it right, looking at it from the other side. And I think he really speaks powerfully, painfully, and unflinchingly about what a reign of terror is over the physical body. Now, Scott was from the upper middle class. He was from a good family. But one of the problems with Scott speaking against his class is then you become a class traitor, which means you're open to the same things that are done to people who don't belong to your class or your race. And it's interesting to me that Scott had grown up um, around Poles and Swedes, had sent many miners over to Morris Run, Pennsylvania, and Scott's grandfather was the um, czar of the town for 43 years. He was a strong armed man. What Tsar Nicholas um, Nearing said went. But Scott worked in the mines, he worked in the sawmill, he worked with these individuals. And he had seen, I've just found a photograph from uh, 1875 of the housing and it's log cabins right next to the coal tip. And there's cabin, 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 cabin running down right by the slag heap and right here, right next to the house, is the outhouse and there's the clothesline going from the outhouse to the house and there are the women in the yard. So Scott, then when he was in uh, Pennsylvania was part of the child labor committee, going against child labor. So he'd gone into the slums all over the industrial northeast. He had seen poverty. And, but when he uh, started looking into black America in 1926-27, my first contact with life in the slave belt floored me. I was quite unprepared for the silent, passive, terrifying acceptance of segregation, degradation, exploitation that I encountered. The litter, the filth, the squalor, the ugliness 
of the hopeless blanket of poverty which I found in city and rural slums was revolting. The morass would persist until it was cleaned out by government action or abolished by social revolution. Each time Scott looks into something like child labor or profiteering or the plutocracy or the treatment of black America, he is further radicalized each time because he will not swallow the bromides of wishful thinking. He simply won't. And he becomes more outraged when people try and feed it to him. And so each time something like this happens, he becomes more radicalized, more outspoken. The threats keep coming in. And yet still, he goes out there. So in March of 1918, you have a tar and feathering threat. Then that same month, the grand jury indicts him under the Sedition Act of 1917 for this uh, pamphlet here, The Great Madness. Oh, by the way, The Great Madness, that was a phrase that he took from Woodrow Wilson. He was very smart in the way he did things. But what the government basically said, what Scott was arguing in this pamphlet that because of the profiteering, that people should understand what they were fighting for. They were not fighting to make the world safe for democracy. What they were fighting for was making the world safe for uh, financiers' investments. And that their payback would be um, being crippled or killed. That was your payback for the service you put to your country. And again, all the patriotic stuff was just a bromide. So what happens at this point, he gets indicted by the jury for this. And he's on a lecture tour. Surprise. What's the first thing Scott do, do, uh, do when he is, hears he's indicted by the grand jury? What would he do? It's the New York City grand jury. He goes right to New York City. And he surrenders. And uh, his friends have picked up. They knew this was coming. And they put him out. Uh, they paid the $5,000 bail. And then he's back out on the lecture tour. So anytime anything like this went down with him, he always knew that, felt his time was limited. And therefore, he had to speak even more and more straight to the point. So that summer, the judge uh, hears an appeal to reject uh, the sedition charges. The judge, learned hand, a vaunted jurist of the New York circuit from that period. Anyway, it's dismissed. And so he's going to go to trial in the late, uh, the winter of 1919. So what are you going to do between that and being indicted and the judge saying, no, you're going to be charged and you're going to trial? What would you do? Well, what Scott does is he runs for the mayor of New York City under the socialist ticket. And he's, um, the, um, the powers that be are so terrified that the socialists are going to rise up that they bring back from Italy the World War I flying ace, uh, what's his name, Fiori LaGuardia. And it's a, it's a fusion ticket. He's not Democratic, he's not Republican, he's a Democratic Republican. Because the two organizations are absolutely terrified of Scott. And so they go and they have debates. And one of the interesting things about those debates is, um, well, he pulls little things like, oh, well, he shows up in his uniform khakis. And when he's at debates, he asks Scott what division he's in. So these little uh, digs. But at the end of one of the debates, somebody asked um, him what he thought of Scott as a debater. And LaGuardia said, he's not a debater, he's a poet. So I think you can understand, number one, the eloquence that Scott had, but also, two, uh, number two, why they feared him. Because he wasn't just a speaker, that he had a way in uh, transmission, transmitting his, um, his point of view and his reasoning across to people. Uh, some of the best, from the 20s, some of the best reports that we have uh, of Scott's speeches are from uh, the early FBI files. And one of the ones that I read that was really interesting to me, it was uh, New York City, of course, and it was full of anarchists. So it was kind of chaotic, but Scott held the floor and talked his line. And the person who was recording the speech said, you can read the article, and he's following Scott's reasoning, point by point, point, and you can hear the excitement. He's getting it. 
Scott is getting through to him. He's understanding reasons and how it all fits together. And in the very last paragraph, the guy catches himself. Of course, this is seditious, and this has absolutely, this is against the American way, and blah, blah, blah. But you can actually see Scott's argumentation getting through to somebody who's there to take him down. So I think that just is a point of, um, point of how strong a speaker and a reasoner he was. So he goes to court 6th through 19th of February. He does have a lawyer. Uh, Morris Hillquit, who's a very famous socialist of the time, acts as his lawyer. And he does have uh, some backing because this is a very important case. And many of the pacifists who had been um, taken to court were basically thrown away for 10 years. Eugene Debs is one. Um, there are several out on the West Coast, anarchists who are, and socialists who were thrown into jail. So this was serious. This was a serious situation for Scott. And what he basically did, they decided that they figured he was going to be indicted, not only indicted, but found guilty and sent to jail. So they decide, Scott basically decided that the courtroom was his classroom, that if they were going to throw him away, that he was going to have his say in court. And he sat on the, um, I think it was, he was up there on the stand for three days. And he let, read the entire pamphlet to the jury. And as he was reading it, he would stop to explain a little bit more what his reasoning was. Why did he say this? And why did he say that? We have transcripts here of that case. Because the Rand School put it out afterwards. And in the end, um, there was a point at which his lawyer made an objection and said, Your Honor, I'd like my client not to answer that question. And <laughs> the judge said, if you can't control your, uh, your client, then I won't. And Scott pipes up and says, uh, may I answer the question, please? So he really viewed it as a point of uh, communication. It was very well uh, covered in the New York papers. And at that time, you got to remember, the New York papers had, oh, I don't know, there must have been uh, eight to ten papers, dailies in New York City, because you had the morning papers and you had the afternoon papers. Those were all gone now. But there was a whole world of newspapers, and that was the communication of the time. And the other thing that happened was it went into the jury, and Scott was acquitted by a vote of 10 to 2. They had gotten on the jury all these gentlemen at this point, of course, who were entrepreneurs and businessmen. The two of them were from Eastern Europe, and they were Jewish, and they had gone through the Russian pogroms. So they saw what the U.S. government was doing, and they refused to have anything to do with it. And it was because of their two votes that he walked. So he was very fortunate that he was a good um, explainer. But he was also very fortunate he had those two individuals on the, on the, the jury. So that's 30 months of one man's life. And what was going on at this point? I think in this time period, I would estimate, just thinking about it, I would say he probably made close to 200 speeches during this time. And this is as they're closing uh, halls down to him. Churches that have um, opened up the pulpits during the rest of the week for speeches and whatnot and debates. Um, they're cutting him off. Mayors will shut down auditoriums on him. And yet he is still able to speak that much. And then finally the war pretty much wipes out the radicals. <laughs> and he ends up piecing together the rest of his life. One of the interesting things, too, is like, oh, when he gets, uh, when they go into this here where he gets kicked out of the University of Toledo, at that point he has, I believe, nine titles out with Macmillan Publishing, textbooks. He is making more on his royalties on his textbooks than he is getting being a professor at University of Toledo or the Wharton School of Business. Plus, he's writing articles and magazine articles and newspaper articles that are syndicated. They go to Harper's. They go to all the big papers of the time. 
So he has quite an income. All that goes, drops. 1917, Macmillan sells everything off at a cheap price or shreds it, and that's the end of his royalties. So he not only lost his livelihood as a teacher, he also lost his platform as a speaker, but he also lost his livelihood as a writer. So he had to reconstruct that through the 20s, which he did, but it was a long, long, difficult haul. But in each of these cases, when something like this came up, it radicalized him more because he knew he was on the right track because people were trying to shut him down. That's an unwilling citizen in a warfare state. He's a piece of work. Sure. Um, during those speeches, was he more or less going through the reasoning from the Great Madness pamphlet, or was he, do you have any sort of like, active account to motivate around something? Or? No, I, he was very much a teacher, so he was presenting what he said was his research, okay. that these things were interconnected through the financiers and the banks. So he was hitting that constantly. Um, if you, well, uh, you see he had these long, elongated pages like this that he would type up all of his outlines. And he would go uh, with those outlines. And he usually carried uh, 8 to 14 when he was on a speaking tour so he could go into any subject area he was interested in. And with those, 8 or 14 also went a box with index cards. And those index cards were numbered. So as he's going through a particular speech, there are numbers next to it. If he wants to drop into a quote, he says, this is what I'm saying, but if you don't believe me, this is what I've found in the research. And he could go to the index card and tie that into the text. So it's a very um, amazingly dense, interlineated uh, collection way of doing speeches. Very much, very much so. But he, he did that throughout his life, well into his 70s, into his 90s. It was just the way he worked. There's Over there, there's whole card catalogs of that in there. And Helen, over time, developed the same habit. So it was incredibly effective. And then you just put everything back by numbers. If you pull that speech out again, you just go back into your numbers. And over time, you would actually get back to that number. And you can see where, OK, I started this speech in 1916. Now I'm in 1925. And there'll be a paper clip. And there'll be all the preceding uh, information that he's gathered over time. So he can say, look, I've said this in 1916, but look, by 1925, this is still happening. In fact, it's gotten deeper, and here are the facts and figures around that. So he was very much, one of the things that's really interesting to me is when um, they come in to his house in Toledo, the federal government, Scott's house is the first domestic domicile in the United States to be searched and seized by the federal government under the Sedition Act of 1917. And when this happens, he comes out and he says, there, you will find nothing in there that I have not said publicly. And also, I have written a letter to the federal government asking them not to mess up my cataloging because it's taken me decades to set up the system. <laughs> so, I mean, he's very, it's very interesting. Whenever he's dealing with authority, he, he tries to get his point across on their level. Because basically what he's saying to the federal government is, you don't know how to catalog. And that's an embarrassment. So he, he, he's very facile in the way he presents things. And then he'll say it in public in a newspaper. So it's pretty fascinating the way he goes about things. Uh, Any time there was trouble, he'd, he'd run right into the teeth of it pretty much. Unless he got into the jail. And then he got the hell out as fast as possible. Because jail's dark box. You're in the dark box, all bets are off. Doesn't matter who you are. So were there any recordings of any of his testimony of the trial? Or is that free? No, it's, it's all, uh, it was all sten stenography. So it was transcribed? It was all transcribed and then was put out by the Rand School. It's over there. It's called the Trial of Scott Neary. We have the whole transcript. 1919, coming up, yeah, we're the, the centennial. So yeah, I'm, that's what I'm working towards. Sure. I'm, I'm laying groundwork here. Yeah, sure. I've got a plan, five-year plan. <laughs> You're in year three. <laughs>
<laughs> this is year three. I would prefer to have people do it with me to do a, a, a reading. I'd want to go through and edit it down to uh, two hours because it's a yeah, it's a long trial. No, he's on the stand for three days, but it's a long trial, six to the nineteenth. So it's thirteen days. So I definitely want to compress it. And there's plenty of good stuff in there, so we don't have to go through all the machinations of the court. But I would like to do that here. Yeah. So. Well, there's it, most of them came out in pamphlets. The publishers pamphlets. Oh, what do you mean? Uh, I, we, the earliest recording that I know of Scott is from 1935. Well, bring him on. Get the grant. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I don't read well. We should get if we're going to get a professional, get a professional. I'll do inter. Well, Scott can get me pretty fired up. <laughs> he really can. And it's interesting. Several, more than ten years ago, we had. I had done the play about them. I had taken all their um, their time in Vermont. I took all their letters, and I condensed it into a play. And we had a reading here, and Bob Nearing was here, and Bob said. You talk like the old man. <laughs> I'm like, well, Scott makes it very easy, easy because you can see the cadences. And one thing I noticed was when I was in London years ago, we went to the bunker where Churchill was, and they had some of his speeches out, and he broke all his speeches down as poetry. And as soon as I saw that, you start doing that with Scott, and you start getting the cadences. Yeah, the construction is really powerful when you break it down. It's much easier, and it's much easier to read off the page than as if it's prose. You really need to break it down into those units, because that way you're you're pausing to breathe at certain points. And, it, and I, Scott had taken a degree for, of um, oratory from Temple University. It was one of his first degrees. And even I just was watching one of those videos that was redone uh, in 1977. He sat down with a project about around. Um, radicals and they interviewed him and he was just talking about that he was not a gifted speaker that he was one who had to be taught <laughs> really well after 70 years of practice yeah but it was interesting because I remember going to Morris Run with Bob Nearing and we were going around the house and they took us inside showed us the birthing room then we went out back and there was a little tool shed and Bob points to it and he says that's where Scott gave his first lectures to his brothers and sisters. So I think he, I think he had it in him from the beginning. But there was definitely a style. And what amazes me is that he could fill a 5,000 seat in Madison Square Garden speaking. That's without amplification. That's amazing to me, to have a crowd that big and be able to command it just with the voice. Certainly opera singers do it. But it was a whole different world when it came to speakers back then that has been lost. We don't, we don't have a real sense of it at all. Oh, in the teens. Yeah, right through the teens, up and through, through the 20s. Yeah. Uh, Pre-war and post-war when, when the radicals got big again, or he would be debating Clarence Darrow or Bertrand Russell. They had big venues, and so they would have debates at Madison Square Garden. And those were, you know, those were very, very popular. So he made a resurgence during the 20s? Yeah, didn't keep him down. Right. Yeah, he kept on teaching in various independent schools and uh, started publishing through a lot of uh, radical rags. And he was part of the Garland Fund, which was a Gillette fortune, fortune steel fortune. God decided he didn't want to have his uh, inheritance take over his life, so he gave it over to something called the Garland Fund. And Scott was part of that, and they gave money to radical organizations. So that's how they spent the wealth, was putting it into radical organizations. And in fact, in the end, in 1930, that's how he was able to pay Helen to come back from Europe to be his secretary. Because by that time, he wasn't on the Garland Fund, but he got funding to do his book on war. And so he enticed Helen back because he had funding so she could be a secretary. And that's, in the end, why she got her Social Security. It's because she had been working for Scott all those years.
So yeah, he's an economist. He's not stupid. He knows how to work, how the system works. Um, at that point, it was 1928, and Scott was a um, candidate for governor. Yeah. He was a socialist. But what they really, the socialists wanted was for him to go around the country and speak for other candidates. So he didn't really do much in New Jersey. And I think he got 1,500 votes in the end. So it was out of, I think there were 700,000 cast. He got 1,500. But um, Helen's father was a Republican small R. And so, yeah, he did want Scott to come and talk to his, uh, I think it was his men's group. And he did come, and that was um, kind of where they started meeting from there. And Dad rude the day. But they did make up in the end. They did get along pretty well in the end. It was 70-30. Uh, he got 30% of the popular vote. So for a socialist, that's pretty high. And again, if no, no, Maryland, New York, New York. Oh, okay. LaGuardia, yeah. So, in in a lot of, and that's kind of interesting because then LaGuardia, that's the beginning of his political career. His first fight is with Scott, and it's only because of the war fever that one he becomes a candidate, and two that he, I think, wins really, because he was an infinitely better speaker. But you know, that was the time how all the uh, large cities had wards. And you had ward bosses, and the word went out. X was you're going to deliver X number of votes, so you delivered X number of votes. So, unlike T45. Uh, really, uh, the first time that he gets self-published is um, his first book after all this happens in 1920, called The Next Step. 1920, and it's uh, financed by his wife, Nellie Seeds Neary. And that's the imprint, Nellie Seeds Neary, Ridgewood, New Jersey, which is where they had their farm. They had a small farm there, back when New Jersey was still Garden State. And so that was the first time. And then um, he also was printed, uh, published throughout the 20s by the Rand, and then um, Vi uh, is it Viking, the international um, publishers come, Vanguard. Vanguard Press comes up in about 1922-23. They start publishing these books, like on the, the British stri general strike of 1925 and Wither China in 1927 before he goes to China. So there's a whole stretch of books that come out of Vanguard. And then, again, it, it kind of pitches off in the 30s, and then there's another iteration of, of other publishers, like Open Road, you know, just small organizations. Oh yeah, from all you know, like all the big ones, he wasn't going to be Harper and Row or Scribner's or or any of the big ones who had big distributions. It was all small printing houses. Even Vanguard was pretty famous, but it had a very small distribution. You know, if, if you consider, um, I think his first book, Economics, was printed in ten of, tens of thousands of volumes in a run. There's three print runs. You're probably looking at fifty, seventy thousand in a run. Oh, the Great Madness uh, sold 20,000 copies. Now that doesn't happen later. I mean, you have runs of 1,000. That's the top of the heap. You know, they, when, they find, when Scott and Helen started publishing together in 1950, the Maple Sugar book comes out of the John Day Company in New York City. It's a fairly reputable, reputable uh, publisher. I think they did 2,500 books and it never sold out. That's why we've got the plates out. That's the plates out in your shed up above. Those are all the plates from the Maple Sugar Book because they bought them out from John Day when they um, got didn't want to do it. See, then they did. Um, then the next book they did from Scott was like Economics in the Power Age. I'm like, why did you do that? Well, Pearl Buck was the editor's wife, so she was pushing this, and they, then she got them the right living the good life. Well, they thought they had a contract with John Day Company. And they put it in, and I said, nope, don't want it. And that's when they self-published. That's when they started doing SSI, Social, Social Science Institute, so they could get the book out. So yeah, every time they crashed, somebody crashed them. <laughs>
We just found another avenue. And of course, one of the interesting things about the Social Science Institute is they basically base their whole structure on what they had developed in the maple syrup business. Because a, a large mar of their business was mail order. So they took their mail order system and just applied it to books. And through the 30s, they're doing this cross between the two. Now, Helen's down in New York City in their apartment, and she's um, addressing all like, thousand envelopes at a time. And it's all in-house. And it's like she's got 10,000 to do, and it takes her 10 days to get all those things out. So it was, yeah, she was the workhorse. She was also the one who would go to the printers. She was the one who decided on what typeface was going to be, what the display face was going to be, what the paper was going to be, what the size of the book was going to be. She became very involved in that and was, had a very good eye. Like if you look at Living the Good Life in the first edition, I couldn't figure out what face it is. It's a face called Fairfield. Well, Fairfield didn't come out until 1952. This book's published in 1954. She's literally on top of what's happening in the typographic world. And, find, and you also notice in the, on the back page, it's always a union shop. It's, they always have their books printed in a union shop. So there's all these little details that you see as, that run throughout. And so anytime you scaled something up, that system can be transposed to something else. So just move it up. Don't rebuild it. Just move it over here, recalibrate, and then go from there. So uh, indomitable, I'd have to say. That's the word I think of when I see what they went through and how they responded to it. I mean, most of us would have been crushed back in 1916. Uh, from about 19, well, they moved to Vermont in 1932 and they kept it until 1940. So it was their base of operation down on the Lower East Side. And uh, especially during the wintertime when Scott would go on three or four month lecture tours, uh, Helen would stay there and she would be the base of operation. So each time, if he needed more pamphlets, she could send it to the next station. And at the same time, he's sending back manuscripts for her to type. He's writing books on the road, literally in hotel rooms, on the train. And he's also keeping his correspondence up at that point too. So I, he was incredibly productive no matter where he was. And part of it was, was Helen. And again, I'll go back to Bob Meering. I remember Bob Meering sitting here and he said, no Helen, no good life. And that meant on all levels. She was more than a workmate. I mean, she, again, just going back to what she did with the publishing is uh, something that there's so many areas that need to be researched on them. Yeah, there's so much there. It's me excited, <laughs> especially since I'm a printer. Hmm. Thank you for coming out in the rain. Mm -hmm.